The end of Black Ops 2 is, in my opinion, the biggest inflection point in the zombie mode's now almost 15 year history. In all these retrospectives so far, I've tried to make the case that every map from the very beginning in Nocturne and Toten until at least the end of Black Ops 1 was a part of a very linear crescendo where you could see that each release was a natural evolution on the one that came before. Transit did break the pattern a bit, it was very bold and different, but the key there is that those changes didn't stick. It's not like the maps that came out after it built on top of that new open world, point of interest based formula. Instead, Transit was left alone as a bit of an outlier. The next couple maps would introduce new things and evolve the mode in their own way, but it was along a trajectory that looked more similar to what we'd been seeing before. When Mob of the Dead came out a bit later, it felt like a prototype for a different possible new direction, but at the same time it also could have just been left alone as this self-contained little narrative experiment. Origins, though, feels like a fully realized version of that vision, and even more so than Mob, feels like the real commitment to that new era. It was the one that really felt like a massive leap forward in almost every aspect of the game as opposed to just incremental improvements. Both gameplay-wise and with the story, Origins was them taking everything they'd learned over three games worth of making maps and almost rebooting the mode into a Zombies 2.0. The big, generational leap forward that was promised at the beginning of Black Ops 2 was finally realized on the battlefields of the Great War. Every journey begins with a single step. This is step one. A lot of individual evolutions come together to make Origins so iconic, but one of the core pillars that really defines the map is the Easter Egg. Besides Mob, no other map had ever had their main quest be so front and center and so much a part of the main experience. As you play through the rounds, over and over again you'll hear Samantha's voice in your head begging and sometimes threatening you to complete the steps. And in a bunch of other places, like when you use the new equipment, the Maxis drone, again that same goal gets repeated. It wasn't that it was guiding you through it, the steps were still obscure and cryptic, but it was clear to anyone listening that the story was something you were supposed to be aware of. You were given a lot of new tools to play around with, and you could still use it as a sandbox to experiment in, or you could play it for high rounds, or play however else you wanted, it wasn't that it was a linear mission or anything. But the fact that you're constantly being hounded and led back to the steps highlights that the intended experience, as crafted by the developers, is that you always eventually slowly work your way to completing the egg. Beyond all the voice lines, the other way that Origins incentivized players to complete the quest was how interconnected it was with the progression of the map. Every time you load in, even if you don't have the easter egg on your mind, you'll probably still want to build one of the staffs just for its wonder weapon capabilities, and then at that point you might as well upgrade it so that it kills zombies better. Then, once you're there, you've already chipped away at a big part of the first step of the easter egg. You've been working towards it without even intending to. Later steps had side effects like upgrading your drone or your melee power, so even a player who doesn't care about the story, or the characters, or the achievement is still incentivized to go through it anyway. Compare that to something like Shangri-La. Doing the tile matching game or leading a napalm zombie through the tunnels has no intrinsic value, you only do it because that's just what you do to get to the next step. With Origins, doing the map setup is doing the easter egg. They're not two different parts of the game, there was a clear attempt to synergize them and make doing the quest a core part of the experience and vice versa. Not really related at all, but I had to mention it somewhere, the 8 steps for the easter egg were also the same 8 steps that Reznov used to escape Vorkuta in Black Ops 1, so it had the nostalgia factor going for it as well. Step one. Secure the keys. This is step one! Secure the keys! Outside of the fun little reference, I think the steps themselves are some of the best crafted ones in the series to that point. A small part of that is that they definitely do feel good because they give you rewards, but that's not really what I'm talking about. The main thing is that even though it can take 2 hours or more to get it done, at no point is there any tedium. You never need to get lucky with box RNG, or wait for something to spawn, or do anything too repetitive like building the plane on Mob of the Dead. Each step feels very much under your control, which is why it's such a rewarding map to practice and develop the skills for, because you never have to rely on anything external. It's all a matter of your own execution, which can be honed and tangibly improved. 
The only time that's not true is when you're doing it solo, where it's technically doable, but that introduces a lot of tedious back and forth carrying the staffs to and from the crazy place, and the rain fire step is really finicky. I don't really hold that against the map though, because I still don't think that the solo easter egg completion was one of the design concerns yet. The intended design is for the four prophesized heroes to all work together, and when you do that, it's a really smooth and challenging but rewarding experience. When the players got to the end of the easter egg, they were given a bit of a choice. Up until that point, the crazy place was this big, open area that would have been perfect for training into the high rounds, except that the layout was constantly changing with walls slamming down to create new pathways. It was really easy to find yourself trapped in a corner through no fault of your own. Once you completed the second last step though, the walls stopped falling, leaving you with that big open area with access to all the wonder weapons, no mud to slow you down, and no boss zombies. So, gameplay minded players could just stop there, which still gave you the achievement, and just take that big drop in difficulty as their reward. But, if you were more focused on the story, or if you got bored of that, you could do one last step to willingly end your game and unlock a hidden cutscene. Instead of just focusing on one type of player, they tried to make it so that it was equally rewarding for all Zombies fans. In classic Zombies fashion, the cutscene raised a lot more questions than it answered. The camera zoomed out from the map that we'd been playing on, to two kids playing in the child's room from Kino der Toten. Eddie and Sam were playing with action figures of the player characters, and the room was full of other paraphernalia of things from other maps, like a mannequin from Kino, or Shangri-La's Pack-a-Punch totem, or the transit bus. Samantha was literally holding and directing the physical camera in the scene, raising the question of whether the entire zombie storyline had just been a dramatization of kids playing with toys. We were left with this as our last piece of new information for over two years. At the time, we obviously didn't know anything about Monty's house, so we didn't know what was real or where the story could possibly go next. Even with how front and center the story was on the map, it still perfectly carried on that tradition of ambiguity and leaving everything open to interpretation and over-analysis. Jason Blundell, the creative lead for this era of zombies, talked a lot about how integral and intentional this open-endedness was in the design for the mode. By not explaining every little detail in straightforward cutscenes and instead leaving big gaps in the story, the writers empowered the community to work together to fill in those gaps. Getting the fans to be active in the process like that instead of just being passive consumers ended up creating a way more engaged and passionate community in the end. I think the kind of key to great storytelling is making things that are provocative, things that um, challenge you and make you think about stuff. I think my job is not to troll people. Yeah. My job is to try and kind of make stories, make narratives, gameplay that um, engage people. And so. On top of the main quest of rescuing Samantha, there was also a real explosion of smaller side Easter eggs. From the very beginning, maps had always had little missable things like notes or radios to give the mode that sense of mystery and discovery, but from now on we would start to see a lot more that had tangible gameplay implications. For example, there was a new power-up added to the pool, Zombie Blood, which had the same effect as the VR-11 or the Vulture Aid Gas Cloud, where it would make you undetectable to zombies for 30 seconds. You could just get it naturally as a drop, but if you wanted, you could use the ice staff on three random fires around the map, something you would never do organically and have no reason to try, and get a guaranteed one every round. Or, separately, while in Zombie Blood, you could see special highlighted dig sites that would let you dig up a power-up that would give you an extra perk slot you could fill up with a perk that you bought later, letting you eventually work your way up to carrying nine simultaneously. Again, this is something that's more of an involved process, and something you actually have to learn about and then execute, as opposed to the simplicity of the free perk bottle drops on Ascension or Die Rise. Other things, like the G-Strikes, the monkey bomb equivalents that distracted zombies and then called in artillery on them, weren't in the box to start. You had to get kills in two tight areas and then platform around the map to unlock them for the first time. Realistically, you could almost count the wonder weapons themselves as easter eggs or side quests more so than regular buildables. You could get the ray gun mark 1 or 2 from the box, but the real stars of the show were the elemental staffs, which you had to build by collecting pieces from across the entire massive map. The only thing that really compared to that level of commitment required and how much you had to explore the whole space to get your reward was, realistically, the jet gun from Transit. 
But here, because of the inventory system reducing a lot of the need for back and forth, and because of how powerful they were and how they felt statistically worth it, they have pretty much the opposite reputation. And as a bonus, there were four different variations that could all be built and wielded simultaneously, which was a great way to ensure that everyone was able to have fun instead of making what should be a cohesive team fight amongst each other for limited weapons. I bet a lot of people have had the experience of letting a friend bleed out because they want their Wunderwaffe to go back into the box, or used a time bomb to go back before someone else got the paralyzer. While that kind of trolling is a lot of fun for one person, and makes for a good moment to remember, this is probably a better way to make sure that everyone has a sustained good time all game. They're right on that line between basic buildable and quest, because they're definitely more complex than just finding the pieces lying around. Each one forces you to engage with different systems of the map, so for one, they feel really built into the DNA of Origins specifically. More generally, they were an introduction for both new and old players as to the level of depth and side content that this new generation was going to offer. The Ice Staff parts get you to use the new digging mechanic, and the Fire Staff makes sure that you're exploring the entire area end to end. Lightning got you using the new transportation system in the tank, which was an evolution on Transit's bus that took you around the map for as long as you could actively defend it. Finally, Wind teaches you about the giant robots that walk around the map, that can crush you if you're not paying attention, and how, if you're quick enough, you can shoot their foot and get taken inside to a safe area with no zombies for a while. Each one was a little introductory quest that was meant to get you comfortable with the idea of maybe looking up guides and committing fully to learning all about the quirks of new maps going forward, more than had ever been necessary before. Now, those initial missions to get them built in the first place were more involved than anything we'd seen for anything besides main easter eggs before, but they were still bordering on being solvable on your own. It was still plausible that a player could play the map for the first time, and as long as they were paying attention, you could see how they'd be able to find the three pieces, and the right record, and the gramophone, and use it all at the right portal. But, once you got a staff built, they all had a secret second quest that you could do to upgrade them as opposed to being able to pack-a-punch them, and those started to really show the complexity the mode was diving into. Most of them required you to know both how to read cuneiform and work in a ternary number system, and then you had to run around the entire map interacting with dozens of little things that looked like set dressing. Just upgrading two or three staffs was more steps and more complex than most maps' main easter eggs. It was worth it though, with each upgraded staff getting a powerful melee swing, a ballistic knife-like ability to revive teammates from a distance, and the option to charge your shot to create an area of effect trap that changed depending on the element, but most could kill zombies up to and including round 100. All these little mini-secrets on maps going forward gave players the opportunity to become experts and get practical rewards for putting the time in and being committed fans of the mode. The problem, on Origins at least, was that between the really good wonder weapons and the perks, upgrades, and utility that you could get by really learning the map, you could theoretically get very powerful. So, trying to make sure that that quote-unquote intended experience had a smooth progression, the map was tuned to be pretty tough to balance all those optional upgrades out. For example, even though there was a lot of open space on the map, almost none of it was viable for training because it was covered in mud that would slow your running speed way down. In past maps, stamina up was more of a convenience, a nice to have perk, but here it almost needed to be one of your core four with how slow and unmaneuverable you were without it. Then, every couple rounds, one or more Panzer Soldats could spawn, armored zombies that could only be killed with headshots or AoE effects like the staffs. They had a melee attack that could down you in two hits regardless of jug, a flamethrower for medium range, and a grapple hook that could grab you from a distance and pull you in towards them, trapping you until you freed yourself with a precision shot. That last one was so dangerous because it would usually be running with the rest of the horde, so you're getting pulled into the middle of all that where everything can get hits on you simultaneously. Because of how dangerous and hard to kill they were, and because the first one was always guaranteed to spawn on round 8, the Panzer imposed a very clear time limit on the setup phase for the map. Instead of the game gradually, smoothly increasing in difficulty over time, it felt like now there were a very specific number of rounds before you hit a brick wall every single game. You were, if not forced, at least strongly encouraged to learn a somewhat optimized route so that you'd be able to have Jug and either get a ray gun from the box or, more reliably, build a staff by round 8 every time. 
Again, all of these little things that increased the difficulty actually made for a pretty fun and balanced experience if you were getting all the side rewards. But, for someone who's not looking up any guides and is just playing it like a game of Ascension for example, that kind of player might struggle to even build a single staff, let alone get anything like extra perks. For them, Origins could be a punishingly hard map. Now, that's a very classic and tough game design problem, it's definitely not unique to this game. It's hard to find that perfect balance point where you're giving rewards for optional side content that are meaningful enough to make it feel worth it to do it, while still making sure that that content really is optional and you're not just punishing people who don't get those tools. The goal was to give their most devoted fans some little bonuses for putting in the time to learn the ins and outs of the map, but to some people it came across as the opposite, more spiteful and neglecting the more casual, just want to have fun and run around experience. And that's why some people who had been playing zombies since the very beginning started to fall off the mode at the start of this next generation. Zombies 2.0 wasn't a perfect hit for all players. Pretty much anyone could jump into Kino Drutoten for the first time and be successful on that very first attempt. It was both intuitive and had a pretty smooth difficulty curve, which combined to make it so addictive. Even if something went wrong in your first game, you could still very easily see what the path to success should be on the map. That's why it was so easy to get hooked, because at the end of a session you always felt that it was so doable to jump right back in and do better right away. Origins, to some extent, and it only got more pronounced over time, required a lot more upfront investment. Your first game would almost definitely be pretty rough with you running into multiple roadblocks that you get surprised by and don't know how to deal with, and it might not be immediately obvious what you need to do differently the next time. You do need to be a certain personality type to be willing to commit yourself to that slower process of learning and gradual mastery as opposed to the very casual addictiveness of the earlier era. That's not a bad thing by any means, I'm not saying that it was the wrong decision, but it was a decision that they had to actively make, which I just think is so interesting and bold. For such a mainstream, safe, mass appeal franchise like Call of Duty to take that big leap of faith in losing that more general audience in favor of being able to add depth and experiment with the formula is so exciting to see. That's what's always drawn me to zombies as a mode. From the very beginning, the whole thing has always felt almost counterculture, with Noct being criticized and hidden away by the publishers for being too absurd for their serious war drama. And looking past Origins into Black Ops 3, even when the higher-ups tried to start monetizing the mode and bring in engagement tricks from the multiplayer side, I think you can feel the developers really straining against that by going even more esoteric and more complex. You can really feel the passion that the team had for what they were working on, and I think that dedication to, honestly, artistry makes these maps in this new era worth putting the time into. And that's because there are merits to this approach, as long as you're able to meet the map on its level. While not everyone did, and they did lose some of their audience, the players who were able to put that time in got to appreciate some really unique, complex, and fascinating design choices going forward. For one, while you do have to start out by somehow becoming aware of all these little things you can do, either by diving deep into experimentation or looking up guides and wikis, once you do have that list of possibilities, you have enough to keep you engaged way later than ever before. With every map before this, you had the setup process, which was getting your guns, your core perks, and unlocking Pack-a-Punch. That usually only took you until about round 10 or 15, and then after that you're in the exact same gameplay mode that you would be for the rest of the infinite rounds. High rounds are a thing in the zombies community, and the simplicity of perfecting just that core gameplay loop is a lot of fun in its own way, but I don't think anyone would argue that training zombies for hours and hours is actually novel or engaging gameplay. Round 100 runs are almost more of a test of how patient you are and how well you deal with repetition than an actual technical challenge. Buried took that to the absolute extreme, with you being able to get set up on round 1 or 2, and then after that you really have to make your own fun. Even though it came out right after that, Origins swung in the complete opposite direction. Between building and then upgrading new staffs, getting the G-Strike, or hunting for extra perk bottles, you could have a secondary thing in the back of your mind to keep you engaged and active into the 20s or 30s. You even had the new challenge system to give you explicit goals for the first time, to introduce you to that mindset of juggling multiple things on top of basic survival. 
It was the first time objectives were ever laid out in plain text like that, with things like getting headshots, or spending a certain amount of points so that you'd be able to get a free perk, or pack a punched gun, or some extra power-ups. There was nothing too crazy, mostly stuff that you'd get done over the course of a regular game anyway, but it was just to get you thinking about how it was now possible to get rewarded for more than just point building and surviving. The one challenge that you did have to put a little bit of thought into was filling up the soul chests, needing to kill zombies in small, dangerous areas in limited amounts of time before the robots reset the count. It was a good way to force players to play aggressively for a while and make sure that they're not playing it so safe that they're making it boring for themselves. For that one, you got the 1 inch punch upgrade to your melee, which let you kill multiple zombies with a single hit until almost round 20. That synergized really well with the G-Strike unlock quest. A lot of these upgrades didn't make you linearly more powerful, but exponentially instead, so as you practiced and learned the map, you could start to feel all the pieces really fitting together. One of the biggest criticisms of Origins is the fact that with all these side objectives, players are forced to mentally juggle too many different things. Instead of being able to focus on just what's in front of you and take it one step at a time, you now have to think three steps ahead in each of four different quests so you can have some perfectly optimized route, and that level of mental load just isn't fun for a lot of people. Personally though, I think that criticism is a bit disingenuous. Just looking at the inventory screen can be a bit overwhelming because there are a lot of parts that you do want to eventually get, but if you want you can still take that one step at a time. Like, yes, it is super efficient to dig up all the pieces for the ice staff, and set the lightning upgrade dials, and grab the G-Strike tablet, and fill up all the soul boxes all on your first trip through the map, but you don't have to do that. You can wait until round 10 when you have the whole map open and it starts snowing again to build the ice staff in one big trip, or you can wait to fill the soul boxes until you have a staff built for safety. You can always get to the same point by doing things sequentially. A lot of people who play games have a tendency to want to optimize and do everything flawlessly their first time, and anything that's not perfectly optimal is instantly the same as a failure. It's why you have problems like people quicksaving and checkpointing the fun out of stealth games like Dishonored and Metal Gear Solid. Even though the gameplay of combat encounters and stopping alarms and earning your way back into stealth is very much a part of the design of this genre, people treat losing that ghost checkmark as an instant fail state and never engage with that whole side of the game. I think that same line of thinking is what's behind a lot of people's problems with Origins. They see all these possibilities in front of them, and maybe see speedrunners doing these perfect min-maxed games, and as soon as they start to feel like they're falling behind that perfect run, they get frustrated. But the developer's intention was never for a new player to be able to actually execute these optimized speedruns their first, or even 20th game. Especially with this being the last map released for Black Ops 2, and the last Treyarch zombies we would get for over two years, it was really supposed to be something you would spend some time with. You were meant to have to work your way up to that perfect run, making you really earn that feeling of finally mastering it. It's partially a game design problem, you are supposed to figure out ways to trick players into accepting those minor failures and that slower process of learning, but it's also very deeply rooted in player psychology, and to some extent there's only so much that developers can do. It really is hard to show casual players that those extra quests don't have to overpower the gameplay, they're just another layer on top of the foundation. Unlike Outbreak and Cold War or Vanguard's objective-based maps, the core design here was still round-based survival. All of the collectibles and other things just added dimension around that core, and it came at a good time after 5 years and 15 maps of that same flow of setup phase into mindless execution. Besides all of the big overarching ideological changes, there are a couple smaller things that Origins introduced that are worth talking about. Little evolutions that were the kind of thing you'd expect to see from a new map, but add enough of them up and they really help Origins' status as such a big overhaul of the mode. For example, this map was the first time we ever got a different starting weapon from the 1911. Or, like in Mob of the Dead, a single power switch didn't make sense for a map this big, so instead to allow for a smoother sense of progression, the map was divided into six zones and each one had a single generator. To turn them on, you had to hold out in a small area against a ton of new spawns, which could get pretty tough, especially when you're doing the first couple without Juggernog. Turning on all six was all you had to do to unlock Pack-a-Punch, which feeds into what I was trying to say before. 
Again, you probably needed guides for most of the side content, but they did their best to make sure that it was side content. The very basic setup was intuitive and accessible. The map's version of max ammo rounds was that every once in a while, while you're off dealing with the rest of the horde, a group of Templar zombies would spawn and start taking out generators one by one until you killed them and got your power up. If you want, you absolutely can just ignore them and let them take down however many until you're in a better spot or you've dealt with a majority of the regular zombies. You just have to balance that against needing to reactivate whatever you let them take down if you ever want to pack a punch again, and that could get tough since you have to hold out in that tiny area against zombies that only get more powerful as the rounds go on. Like in Buried, you as a player were given the option to choose how you wanted to engage with the special zombies. They definitely were easier to deal with while they're busy attacking a generator, but that comes at the cost of interrupting whatever else you were doing at the time. There's a choice with pros and cons on either side, and you're given the ability to make that choice, making you feel like an active participant in the game's flow. The Der Wunderfizz machine appeared for the first time, which was basically a mystery box for perks instead of guns. It even made some perks available that didn't have a machine on the map, so you could get Electric Cherry or PhD Flopper, you just had to spin multiple times to try to get lucky. We got both new and old buildables with the shield and the Maxis drone, which acted like a portable turret that hovered around you shooting zombies and revived anyone who went down. The drone was one more example of how the map had so many functional easter eggs both because it gets upgraded during the main quest, and also because it has an obscure side mission to get a free pack-a-punched LMG. There was the new digging mechanic, where you picked up a shovel and could use it to interact with the randomly spawning dig sites, which encouraged you to move around the map throughout a round instead of staying in one spot. You could dig up anything from an extra zombie or a live grenade to a blood money power-up that gives you a couple hundred points or a free weapon. By using it enough during a match, you could upgrade it to the Golden Shovel, which lowered the odds for the bad stuff and added better rewards to the pool like better guns and the Golden Helmet that let you survive a robot stepping on you. The idea that this map was something of a reboot was most obvious in the playable characters. The Primus crew was made up of some familiar faces, Tank Dempsey, Nikolai Belinsky, Takayo Masaki, and Dr. Edward Richtofen. They were the same basic characters we'd gotten used to playing as Ultimus, and after a whole game without them, it was almost nostalgic to get them back. But in this new telling, which we would later find out was an alternate dimension, not only were they all 20 years younger because that's just where we were in the timeline, but they were also a lot more well-rounded and less one-note cultural caricatures. They had nuance and dimension, which let the writers go on to tell some really heartfelt and engaging stories with these characters who had just started off as jokes. The general atmosphere of the space itself was really unique, too. You had the World War I setting that felt just that little bit more primitive than what we'd been used to, and the muddy, claustrophobic trenches that it brought along. The skybox was really striking, with the dogfights between biplanes and zeppelins going on. But that's not it. You had not just one, but two more setting elements layered on top of that more grounded base. There was the fantastic mysticism element with the portals and the secondary dimension and the medieval vibes that the crusader zombies brought in. And then you also had the steampunk, early 1920s sci-fi inspired layer with the look of the staffs and the 100 foot tall giant robots walking around. It was a combination of elements that was not only new to zombies, but I don't know if I've ever seen any media with this exact mixture, which helped it to become so iconic because it was hard to compare to anything else. Speaking of atmosphere, the dynamic weather system was really subtle, but still added a lot of variety to the experience. The map feels a surprising amount more calm and muted when it's snowing compared to how much more oppressive it feels when it's raining instead. Origins was really pushing the limits of what was possible on the Xbox 360 era of consoles, so those economical small touches that had a disproportionately large impact made it feel a lot more advanced than it actually was, without feeling like it was straining to keep up like Transit did. Now, I would never go so far to say that Origins is perfect. The developers absolutely did have to sacrifice a lot to go through this revolution. People deep in the bubble of the Zombies community, where this is pretty much universally beloved, can forget that this is the map that a lot of people point out as the moment where they stopped playing the mode. Even someone who was keeping up and playing every map as it came out could still hit a brick wall with Origins. It was just that sudden of a shift in design ethos. 
But at the same time, the fact that that zombies community exists at all and is so tight-knit has a lot to do with exactly what this map was doing. The fact that you did have to put all that time in and be so passionate to be successful made it that much more rewarding when you did reach that feeling of mastery. And when someone else was able to match your level of skill and knowledge, you knew that there weren't any shortcuts, so they had to share your level of passion, letting you bond over not just liking the same game, but being truly invested in it. It's not for everyone, but the depth and variety of experiences that this and later maps provided is what really took Zombies from being a clever and well-executed but not entirely original game mode to something truly special. One of the most fascinating, cryptic, and rewarding experiences on the market.